Hello to Screen Math. It's Friday afternoon. Should have made this video one week ago, but uh, what I wanted to do last weekend, but I am doing now, is recording a video of myself teaching the bulk of Chapter 2 of Gossip. What is Chapter 2? It's um, set theory, uh, an introduction to propositional logic, to predicate logic, uh, and uh, also some other things that, that we're going to skip. So, we did set theory, you know, extremely quickly in like 20 minutes or something like that on um, the second day of school, but now I want to talk about logic. Alright, so I want to do this ex very quickly. Uh, what I try to do in a normal year um, live at school is do this whole thing in one 90-minute um, block. Uh, where I talk kind of as fast as I possibly can. And uh, here I want to maybe do it even even shorter. And then also I recommend you watch this on two times speed. Uh, it's also possible that you maybe don't even need to watch this at all. Uh, but, uh, and in fact you could just kind of read or skim chapter two. Um, but uh, I certainly don't want to devote our limited uh, live class time to it. So I'm gonna go. Hopefully this video is like an hour. That's all. Because that's all I want to say about it. And uh, a good question is, uh, why are we studying logic at all? Well, because we're doing mathematics. And um, so uh, maybe there is uh, some uh, basic amount of logic uh, that you need in order to, to do math. Uh, but maybe not, <laughs> okay? So uh, logic uh, is something that we're all kind of born with. Maybe it's a, it's a basic uh, way of thinking that all humans uh, agree upon, and so uh, that's a little bit of a lie, but, um, you know, one can, can think logically, reason logically, do logic without any formal training in logic whatsoever. And, in fact, the, the formal study of logic um, didn't begin until the 19th century, the mid-19th century, and really sort of until the 20th century was, was when uh, some uh, of the modern uh, form of logic took shape. So, uh, mathematicians were certainly doing tons of math before then. And uh, so, uh, in some ways, you could potentially ignore all of uh, formal logic, which is what I'm going to explain in a minute, and uh, just go with your basic common sense. And, uh, all right, if that's your position, fine. Uh, but a little bit of training in formal logic might be a really good idea. There might be times at which um, you were constructing a mathematical argument, and you find yourself... Um, going down into such a level of detail that it becomes kind of distracting uh, to, to just use your, your common sense. And it might be nice to resort, I think it really is kind of a resort, uh, to um, some, some formalisms uh, just to, to kind of clarify uh, your thinking. Okay, so for that reason, uh, I think it is worth uh, a chapter in a book, and it's worth uh, one hour of our time. Uh, so let's, let's go. Uh, also, of course, I teach an entire class called Logic, and uh, a handful of you took it just last semester. Uh, others uh, of you might take it next year, and so I don't want to, um, you know, do things that you already know. Uh, and so I, I don't want to. I'm not going to go into things in a super level of detail. I'm not going to uh, be very sort of philosophical or historical about it or, or linguistic. Uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing, really, really studying what logic is, then then you should take that class. And if you're already a senior. Then you and you didn't take it. You really missed out on a life-changing event. All right. Well, I'm going to stick to the textbook, and I'm really not going to do much of anything outside the textbook. Um, and in fact, I'm going to skip you know a lot of the things that are that are in here. So okay, um, if you want to follow along with the book, you can. Um, we did uh, set theory, like I said, very briefly uh, on uh, the second day of class, and then Gosson has this nice section called uh, Section 2.2: Logic in Daily Life. And he kind of talks about the kinds of things that you might learn about if you took a, like a uh, philosophy class, a logic class in the, in the philosophy department or, 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 or in some kind of social sciences department, uh, all about, you know, making mistakes and, you know, blah, 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 various, like, logical fallacies and things like that. But, okay, never mind all that. Let's just go straight to, to the formalism. And so there's this thing called propositional logic. Right, it's probably already been, like, seven minutes. Uh, propositional logic. What is it? It is the logic of propositions. What is a proposition? A proposition is a statement which is either true or false. Uh, what does Gossett say? He says, uh, yeah, this, this system is built around statements, propositions, he says. 
And uh, here are some examples of, uh, of propositions. Uh, this is just straight from the textbook, our textbook. It is raining in Death Valley. Okay, it's either true or false that it's raining in Death Valley right now. Probably false. It's pretty dry there. 3 squared is 9. Yeah, that's a proposition about math. Uh, in fact, about arithmetic. In fact, it's true. Uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I told you this gossip. Uh, no comment. Uh, there is sentient life on at least one other planet. Unclear. Uh, that's either true or false, I suppose, but, but we, don't, uh, we don't know. Uh, okay, then he has some examples of, you know, not statements, such as, if John is sick. Well, that's just not even a complete thought. That's what one might have called, once upon a time, a uh, dependent clause. It's not uh, true or false, it's just says, if John is sick. It's just not a complete sentence at all. Uh, assign 7 to y. That's like some kind of computer science command. That's not a proposition either. It's certainly not true or false. The rain in Spain. Well, that's not a proposition. That's just a noun phrase. Uh, you need to add some kind of verb to that, or rather, uh, well, okay, add that to some kind of verb. Um, Daddy, read me a story. <laughs> okay, uh, that's just kind of some kind of request, or, or maybe that's a kind of a command. All right, so these kinds of things, you know, questions, commands, etc., these are, these are not propositions. All right. Uh, well, what is propositional logic? Uh, propositional logic is uh, the, the, the logic which analyzes the relationship between uh, the truths of various propositions. And what we can do in propositional logic is we can create a more complicated propositions out of so-called atomic propositions. So, um, it's raining in Death Valley is an atomic proposition, it's either true or false. And uh, we can now create, uh, using these so-called connectives, uh, more complicated propositions and uh, their truth values will depend on the truth values of, of the pieces. Okay, so, so let's go. Yeah, so we're gonna just do some like, you know, truth tables and stuff. So let's, let's, let's begin. So suppose you have um, some uh, proposition P. Well, it can be either true or false. And you have some proposition Q. It can be either true or false. So these are now variables which uh, represent propositions. They're called propositional variables. And therefore, there are sort of four possibilities in general uh, for a, um, uh, if you want to consider all uh, possibilities uh, for, for two uh, propositional variables, P and Q, you could have that uh, P is true and Q is true. You could have that P is true and Q is false. You could have that P is false and Q is true. And you could have that uh, P is false and Q is false. Those are the four possibilities. And, uh, okay, great. Well, considering these, 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 these possibilities, um, I hereby define a, a symbol. And the symbol is the and symbol. So this little, you know, thingy here, this is and, we pronounce it and, and here's my definition. Uh, the definition is that when uh, P and Q are both true, then I want uh, the proposition P and Q to be true. And uh, when, when one of them is true, one of them is false, it should be false. And uh, false here, and of course, if they're both false, it should be false. Okay, so here what I'm doing is I am, I am, Doing some math, you might say. I, I am uh, giving a definition of a symbol. It's a binary symbol. How am I supposed to interpret this binary symbol? Well, if P and Q are propositions and you put a binary symbol in between them, now this is a proposition and this proposition is either true or false. And it's true or false according to some kind of rule. And this is the rule. To, to, to decide whether P and Q is true or false, you simply consult the truth values of the, the propositions of which, of which uh, it is composed. Okay, so that's a definition, but now here, you know, in, in quotes or something, I wrote and uh, next to that uh, symbol because we pronounce it and, and we even call it and, and that's because it supposedly works like and works, and it works pretty well. This is how the word and uh, works. If you um, analyze uh, the way human beings, uh, English speakers, use the word and, this is kind of just what they mean, right? When you say something and something else, uh, then that sentence that you utter should be true precisely when both of the pieces are true. And if one of them is false, then your sentence is false. All right, so that's pretty uncontroversial. Um, and then there's like another symbol. There's the or symbol. And, uh, okay, the or symbol we define like this. True, 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 false. That is to say, well, once again, you, you can't argue with me because it's just a definition. This is a symbol, it's a binary symbol, and I'm teaching you the truth table is, uh, what, what I'm giving you right now is, in fact, the definition of this symbol. And so here I'm using the truth table 
uh, in a specific way, I'm using this uh, truth table as a, a way of defining uh, what this what this binary um, uh, connective uh, is supposed to mean. And uh, the answer is, you know, this this uh, column is the definition of P or Q. Uh, it tells you precisely under what conditions it should be true or false, uh, based on the the truth values of the um, of the atomic propositions of which it is of which it is composed. Or they might not be atomic, but okay. Uh, well, I want to call this OR, but notice that this is um, an inclusive reading of OR. So in uh, normal English, uh, OR is often ambiguous when, when people say, um, uh, you know, okay, okay, okay. Uh, of course I can't think of a single example of a sentence using the word OR, but uh, if you say something like, um, I would like to take a walk, or not. <laughs> okay, I would like to uh, to uh, to to take a walk, uh, or um, go on a run. Okay, those are two different things, uh, and uh, this is a terrible example. Never mind. Uh, I'm not even gonna give an example. This is the inclusive or. It's inclusive in the sense that uh, you know when when P and Q are both true. Uh, then this uh, this or sentence is true. Uh, there is also uh, a sense of uh, exclusive or. Wow, that was terrible. Um, good. Uh, no editing. No going back. Uh, exclusive or is another binary connective, which is this is the kind of standard symbol uh, for it. Um, except yeah. So uh, and what is the exclusive or symbol? It's it's false. Uh, true. True. False. So here, uh, this now the understanding is that uh, it's true when precisely one of P or Q is true. But it's exclusive in the sense that it excludes um, the situation in which P and Q are both true, where it's inclusive or inclusive. Okay. Uh, which one do we use? In mathematical contexts, it's often sort of just preferable to take the inclusive uh, position. Um, so, okay, you know, already uh, here we are, kind of stuck or something, uh, because uh, what are we doing? Are, are we just doing some kind of math off in the middle of nowhere? Or are we trying to, like, you know, capture some sort of reality of life or something like that? I talked about this extensively in my logic class, so I won't kind of re rehash this all now, but um, since there are these two independent readings of the word or, there is some kind of, you know, ambiguity, uh, uh, arguably, uh, in basic normal human speech when you um, use the word or, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's kind of a problem, you know, if you are um, writing some, some sort of legal document or you're uh, drawing up some kind of contract in which um, the, the precise meaning of every single sentence needs to be analyzed, uh, correctly and unambiguously, then uh, a simple use of the word or uh, could lead to problems if one party uh, interprets it inclusively and the other party interprets it exclusively. So you either need to be uh, extremely explicit that you, you intend it to, to be interpreted inclusively or exclusively, uh, or um, in a mathematical context we can simply use these symbols which we've now created kind of artificially uh, intentionally to be unambiguous. Okay, so the only problem now becomes uh, how do we know how to translate from sort of the regular world uh, to our world of symbols? Yeah, that, that's hard, right? So, so uh, you can think of these symbols as, as disambiguating, uh, and so this is kind of maybe a, a superior way of expressing ourselves, uh, superior to, 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 normal, uh, to normal language. All right, going into too much detail, but hopefully this is entertaining. Yeah, what do we need to say? Mm, nothing? Uh, looking good. Um, all right, well, uh, let's just not stop there. Uh, let's just push on with, um, so what else, what else we have to say? These are the definitions. Oh, there's also negation, uh, which I'll, I'll just make a little, um, negation is also a connective. It's a unary connective. So it's not a binary connective. It doesn't connect two propositions together to make a new proposition. It connects like one proposition uh, together to make a new proposition. And so a truth table, therefore, has two to the one uh, rows in it. In other words, I need only consider um, the truth value of, of one propositional variable, that's p. So p is either true or false, and the, and the truth table for not p is like false true. All right, do, 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 what else is there to say? Maybe nothing. Um, maybe nothing. Great. Um, let's immediately move on to the uh, conditional. 
Okay, well, uh, let's go. What does the gossip have to say about this? We're now in section 2.3.5 on page 38, if you want to follow along. Uh, yeah, well, we have these sentences, you know, if, p, then, q. Uh, sentences of the form if, p, then, q are called conditionals. If this is your first time ever hearing this vocabulary, then, okay, good, glad you're watching. Uh, Gossett has some bad names for these things, so I'm going to ignore what he says. And I am going to, to say, you know, the more standard thing, which is to call this the antecedent, antecedent, and uh, to call this the, maybe I should use a different color or something, uh, to call this the consequent. Okay, so antecedent and, oh, that blue is dead. Alright, dead time, dead time. Um, so this is the antecedent, and uh, this guy over here is the is the consequence. And yeah, okay, uh, consequence. And uh, great. Uh, so this this is supposed to this if this. P arrow Q, once again, I, I've invented a symbol. The symbol is the arrow. I'm defining the uh, symbol as follows. And here's just the definition. It's, uh, it's, it's true, false, true, true. Okay, no one can stop me from defining uh, some symbol to be whatever I, I want it to be, but uh, you can stop me if I try to make stronger claims, and the claim, the stronger claim I'm going to make now is that this is a reasonable uh, approximation of the use in English of phrases of the form if p then q. And uh, okay, you really should stop me because this is, you know, sort of basically, you know, wrong or something like that. Um, this is uh, inadequate, uh, oversimplified, not really good way of capturing the true meaning of conditionals. And as I talk about for maybe, you know, I don't know, 45 minutes or something in my logic class, so here I'll spend just three minutes on it, um, conditionals are really complicated, and uh, they're more complicated than, uh, than, than truth tables, than, than a, a simplistic object like truth tables can capture. Nonetheless, it's pretty kind of halfway sort of decent. Uh, how is it uh, halfway uh, sort of decent? I do have like a list of things I want to talk about. Yeah. Um, well... Let's see, what does Gossett have to say about this? Anything good? Let's find out. Uh, he has a little example. His little example, he says, there's another way. Okay, well, what is, what, I should look more carefully at what this guy says. Um, blah, 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 blah. Oh, he says, okay, well, you know, this seems pretty reasonable because after all, if P and Q are both true, then this should be true, right? Uh, you know, if P then Q. Well, P and Q are both true. That sounds like true. But if you say, if P then Q, uh, if it's raining, I'll get wet, uh, but you are, uh, but it is raining, and you're not wet, then somehow you've, you've lied or something, right? Then that's a false statement. It's false to say, uh, if it rains, I will get wet, um, if, in fact, it is raining and you are not wet. Uh, that seems pretty reasonable. And, uh, okay, um, it's these two final rows of the truth table which are, which are strange. Uh, and you might even uh, say that perhaps uh, this, a sentence like, if it's raining, I'll get wet, uh, it's hard to know what to make of it uh, in the condition when it's not raining. It seems as if I can't even evaluate it or something like that. All right, and so um, you learned truth tables uh, in theory, uh, so I thought. Um, truth tables were a part of a, a unit on, on logic that happened in the geometry uh, curriculum, but I think that's just like not true anymore. So it's possible that the first truth table you've ever seen in your entire lives were in, uh, were in um, ninth grade computer science. And it's possible that in ninth grade computer science you actually never uh, looked at this uh, table for conditionals because after all you kind of don't really need conditionals to do computer science. You can just get by with kind of ands and ors. So maybe, maybe this conversation we're having right now you, you've never had before, uh, but it used to be uh, something that, that, that students would learn in, in geometry. And uh, okay, there's a kind of a cute but uh, crappy way that you can uh, convince people that this is not too bad. And, and Gossett jumps right into it. He says, okay. Um, yeah, well, here's his example. He phrases it in terms of a promise. I'm on the top of page 39 now. If you get an A in math, then I will buy you a new sports car. Okay, uh, just everyone's just using the same uh, little example. 
So let's let's uh, let's do this right now. I'm going to make up my own example. Uh, let's suppose that I make a promise to my daughter, and uh, here's the promise. Uh, I say, uh, if you eat your meatball. No, let, let's let's pretend I'm a more uh, healthy parent. If you eat your broccoli, problem is I don't know how to spell broccoli. Some number of C's and I's in there. It's going to be kind of embarrassing if this is wrong. Uh, if you eat your broccoli, uh, then uh, you can have a tucha. What is a tucha? Uh, tucha is the Dutch word for dessert. And I know hmm, uh, perhaps 500 words of Dutch from my three years living in the Netherlands. And <laughs> 20 years later, this is the only word that I still regularly use. Uh, it means dessert. Something about it is just so scrumptious. When you say, I want a dessert, it sounds like you're a big uh, fatty, but if you say, I want a tucha, it sounds really cute. What's a tucha? It's like a, you know, cupcake or ice cream cookie or something like that. I've taught this to my daughter. She now uses it freely. I don't think she understands that it's not a word of English. If you eat your broccoli, then you can have a tucha, says me to my daughter. Well. Uh, let's analyze this sentence. It is indeed a conditional, there's an antecedent, and there's a consequent. The antecedent is, uh, you eat your broccoli, possibly with broccoli spelled incorrectly. Let's call this P. Uh, you can have a tucha, uh, let's call that Q. So now, um, let's try to learn and discover what the truth table for a conditional uh, should be by uh, looking at possible truth values for this antecedent and this consequent, and then deciding uh, whether the um, uh, resultant sentence is true or false. In other words, uh, I have a sentence here. The sentence is, if you eat your broccoli, then you can have a tucha. And uh, if you really need to just kind of stretch uh, things uh, quite a bit, then you can think of this sentence, this promise, as uh, kind of being true or false. The sentence is true, the conditional, if I keep my promise, and the sentence is false if I sort of like don't keep my promise or something like that. Okay, so let's go through all the, the possibilities. In other words, um, let's now, uh, so I, I won't even say P, arrow, Q, I'll say sort of if, if P, uh, then, then Q. Um, and uh, here, the, the specific uh, P and Q that I'm talking about are, are these, these, these P's and Q's from here. So, cha-cha, cha-cha. Okay, let's go. Uh, Alright, so consider the following. We're, we're doing like some science now or something, right? We're, we're exploring uh, by, by playing with an example. Okay, suppose the following uh, situation happens. That is, my daughter eats her broccoli and I gave, then I give her a tucha. Well, that means that P is true and Q is true. And uh, it seems that she, she, the antecedent was true. She met her, uh, she, she did her thing. I gave her uh, the, the, the tucha. And so the answer is true. Um, I, uh, the sentence is true because I did not lie. I, in other words, I kept the promise. Okay, now suppose uh, P is true and Q is false. Well, that is to say, um, she does eat her broccoli, but then because I'm just like a jerk or something, I just don't give her a tucha. Well, to me, this is a flagrant example of me sort of lying, right? I did not keep my promise. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, this sentence becomes kind of, you know, false or something like that, right? The sentence is false because I did not keep my promise. Uh, I, I, I lied um, because she did eat the broccoli and I didn't give her tucha. Okay, so, so far, you know, so good. Um, or, what if she just doesn't eat her broccoli? This happens a lot. Um, yet, I give her a tucha anyway. That's bad parenting. Um, what can I say about the sentence? Well, did I keep my promise? Uh, yeah, I kept my promise in the sense that I didn't break it. Um, my promise was that I would do a certain thing if she ate broccoli, but she didn't even eat any broccoli. So if she didn't even eat any broccoli, then it's not really possible for me to, to have broken the promise. And so by some sort of like, you know, default or something, uh, if I didn't uh, break the promise, uh, then I have kept the promise. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. I think you see where this is going. It's a little wishy-washy. Uh, I'm not trying too hard to be sort of convincing, but this is what people do. 
Uh, all right, if what if she just doesn't eat broccoli and I don't give her tucha? That's called good parenting. Well, then once again, I've kept the promise. Now I think more more clearly, uh, I've kept the promise because uh, I promised I would do something if she ate her broccoli, but she didn't even eat her broccoli, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, I didn't break the promise, so so I kept it. Okay. This is a wishy-washy but not totally terrible way of understanding why we assign the particular uh, truth values, true, false, true, true, uh, to conditionals. Um, how much confidence should you have in this argument? You know, maybe not that much. This is, I think, a good way of, of teaching this topic to someone else. So if you are tutoring someone or something in uh, truth tables and they don't understand uh, why, this is, this is the kind of uh, explanation you can give them. But you know, I'm not super uh, satisfied with this. Um, is there is there like a kind of a better reason why we do this? Well, uh, I think there is a kind of reason. I, I do this in logic, so I'll, I'll do it again right now. Let's see, how, do, how does this work? Uh, consider now a new uh, sentence. Uh, the new sentence goes like this. If uh, x equals 3, then uh, x squared equals 9. Okay, this is a conditional, and it's more typical of the kind of conditional that we will find uh, when we are doing mathematics, which is, after all, the goal here. Um, you know, some certain kind of people, maybe philosophers or something like that, might be interested in, in, in getting the logic, you know, exactly right, so that they're really, you know, capturing sort of the reality of, 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 of various uh, complicated uh, arguments, perhaps philosophical arguments, but in this class, we are really just using logic as a tool to do mathematics, so maybe we should focus on a kind of a mathematical example. So, so here is one. All right, uh, I would like everyone who's watching at home to agree that this sentence is just true. This is just a true sentence. Just search your heart and know that it is true. Okay, if x equals 3, then x squared equals 9. Of course it is. All right, well, having now agreed that it is true, um... Let's uh, examine uh, its pieces, and perhaps we can learn something about, about uh, the logic of conditionals. Okay, well, uh, there's an antecedent. The antecedent here is x equals 3, let's call that p, uh, and this uh, antecedent, uh, this consequent is, is q. Okay, so let's uh, go through a bunch of examples, uh, see whether p, is, p and q are true or false, and uh, see, see what that tells us. Okay. Let's go. Uh, let's first consider some, some values of 3. So now I'm going to have a couple columns here. I'm going to tell you uh, kind of what, what x is, and then we're going to look at uh, what that says about p, and uh, what that says about q, and what that tells us about uh, if p uh, then q. If p uh, then uh, q. Okay, well, consider the following. Consider that x might be 3. Uh, well, if x is 3, then, uh, maybe I want to do this in purple or something. If x is 3, then, uh, okay, then, then p is just, is just true. Uh, and by the way, then, then q is also just true. And, uh, okay, well, we already agreed that this sentence was true. So, things are looking good. In other words, I'm going at this from a reverse direction now. I've given you a sentence uh, which your strong, strong intuition agrees is true. So, whereas before, I asked you whether the sentence is true or false, given various kind of conditions on the antecedent. Now I've given you a sentence which you feel strongly is true no matter what. And, uh, okay, so, all right, let's look at some more examples. How about uh, x is negative 3? Well, if x is negative 3, p is uh, false. But q is true. And yet, this sentence is true, because you told me already in the beginning that this sentence was true. In other words, in mathematical context, it seems uh, actually completely reasonable and at least totally innocent to assign um, the value true to propositions uh, of the form if p then q when p is, p is false and q is true. Here's an example right now where uh, if x equals negative, uh, if negative 3 equals 3, this is saying, uh, then negative 3 squared equals 9. Uh, actually, I don't want to say it that way. That's kind of weird. All right, uh, moving on. What if x is like, you know, 4 or something? Well, if x is 4, then, then this is also false, and this is also false. But now, uh, once again, we agreed that this sentence was true. 
Okay, what just happened here? This is another uh, sort of trick. Uh, trick by, by me, but now it's a little bit of a more subtle trick and arguably it's more convincing. What I've just demonstrated to you are two sort of concrete examples of um, a proposition in which the antecedent was false, the consequent was true, and yet you were perfectly fine assigning the truth value true to that conditional. And here in this uh, second example, uh, once again, uh, or, 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 or uh, in the second example, we have uh, a situation in which the antecedent is false, the consequent is false, and yet you are perfectly comfortable assigning the, the truth value uh, true uh, to, to that conditional. Uh, okay, so this, is, this should maybe sort of convince you a little bit more uh, about, about this. But, okay, does this matter so much? Not really. Uh, all right, there's one more uh, conditional. Uh, this other conditional is P if and only if Q. Uh, what's P if and only? Okay, so that's, this is a whole other uh, thing that requires some kind of a conversation. And uh, all right, if you, if you didn't take logic and you're also not going to take it next year because you just don't want to or because you're a senior, uh, you know, you can, you can email me or something, contact me, and I can send you some links to some sort of longer videos on this. I don't think anyone wants that though. Uh, of me kind of going into the details of this, but basically, what is the biconditional? It's just the conditional in both directions. It's more or less saying if P then Q, and also if Q then P. And uh, what we end up with is, uh, is this. Uh, it's, it sort of says that both of these must be true. That P must imply, that P implies Q, and that Q implies P. And uh, P if and only if Q is kind of a way of saying that they have the truth, the same truth value. So P if and only if Q uh, says that uh, P and Q are both true, uh, or they're both false. Uh, so that's when that's when this sentence is that's when this is true. So this symbol is called the biconditional. This is my definition. But uh, arguably, although it takes some some time and effort to to make that clear, uh, this is a uh, good uh, translation of the English uh, sentence uh, if and only if. So uh, P uh, if and only if. Uh, Q is uh, a, a kind of an artificial uh, sentence which uh, really just says P if Q P uh, if Q and it also says uh, P only if uh, Q and uh, P if Q is uh, basically uh, Q arrow P and P only if Q is uh, P arrow Q, although that's not obvious. Okay, I'm gonna just leave that there. Uh, where are we right now? Uh, blah, 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 biconditional, etc. Okay, good. Um, good, 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 good. Good, good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Can you erase all, uh, all this, or, or like most of it? Moving right through this all. And of slowly, though. <laughs> yeah. Well. 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 Where are we now? Um, some more concepts. What's the whole point of uh, doing truth tables? Why should I care about all these things? Well, like, certain, you know, facts kind of just, like, emerge uh, immediately. Uh, for example, uh, take the following... Uh, take, take, take the following proposition. Not P or Q. Alright, what's up with this proposition? Well, it's composed of, uh, of, of, of P, and then uh, P has been negated to be not P, and then uh, we put an OR in between. Okay, so if I am presented with something uh, like this in the abstract, I might want to know under what conditions is this true or false. Well, this is exactly what truth tables are for. The whole idea of truth tables is you make, what is a truth table? It's, a, it's an explicit uh, list of every possible um, truth condition. So we want to know uh, under what uh, conditions uh, P and Q are true or false, and I'm now going to have an answer to, uh, to not P or Q. Okay, let's go. Well, uh, first I'm going to build this up kind of uh, step by step. Uh, what can I say about not P? Well, not P is going uh, to have the opposite uh, truth value of P, so this will be false, false, true, true. Great! 
Now, I'm supposed to OR these two together. Well, I know how OR works, right? It's always true except, in, except when they're both false. So now, um, looking, uh, focusing my attention on, uh, on columns, uh, columns uh, 3 and 2, I uh, sort of perform the OR operation on these, and I get uh, true, false, true, true. And now, I cannot help but notice that uh, true, false, true, true is, uh, reminds me of something. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, PRQ. And so, what I have here is, just for comparison, I'll throw this in, uh, true, uh, false, uh, true, uh, true. Okay, and so, what does this tell me? These two have the same uh, truth table column. That is, uh, not P or Q is going to be true and false under precisely the same conditions that if P then Q is going to be true or false. So these two are kind of just like the same thing. They're the same thing in the sense that though they might have a different connotation or something like that, uh, their true or false, uh, their truth value, uh, is always going to be identical, because uh, regardless of whether P and Q are true or false. Uh, all right, so this is something that a truth table can accomplish. It can uh, show you that uh, these are logically equivalent. And uh, that's, that's what we call this. We say that these are logically equivalent. Equivalent. And we have a symbol for that. We say that not P or Q is logically equivalent uh, to uh, if P then Q. And this is the, this is the logical equivalence uh, symbol. This is not a symbol of propositional logic. This is a symbol that we use to talk about propositional logic. Specifically, uh, I'm telling you, uh, when I use this symbol, that uh, these two, regardless of whether P and Q are true or false, these two propositions are always going to have the same truth value. Okay, so that's really nice. And, uh, okay, what, what other kinds of things are logically equivalent to each other? Well, there's just so many of them, man. Um, let me just erase this, because it's bad uh, spacing. It's also getting kind of dark in this room, so I'm going to turn this light on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, uh, maybe I want to sort of stumble upon some more facts. Oh, I don't know. Uh, here's one. How about I take a P... Uh, and Q, and then I negate them, and I get not P and Q, but then also I consider, yikes, um, not uh, P and Q, but then also uh, I consider um, uh, not P, and also, no, I did that one already, so uh, I consider not Q, and then I consider not P or not Q. All right, we're doing some real truth tables now. Uh, let's go. What can I say about P and Q? It's going to be true, false, false, false. Fact. What can I say about the negation of that? Well, it's going to be false, true, true, true. What can I say about not Q? It's going to be uh, true, uh, true, false, false. And what can I say about not P or not Q? Now I need to focus my attention on this column and this column. And I'm oring them together, so I get true, I'm really doing it, true, and now I get true, uh, false. Uh, ha ha, I have discovered something. What have I done? Um, wait a second. Um, what have I done? Oh wait, hold on, uh, not P, 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 P and Q. Uh, that's correct, and that's correct, and false, uh, so true, 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 um, wait, something has gone horrifically wrong, but I have lost complete track of even, like, what I'm doing or why or whatever. Uh, true, false, 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 the negation of that is... Zun, zun. Oh yeah, because this is just this is just completely wrong. That's what happened. Um, try that again. Not Q. I'm supposed to be negating this column. Should be false, true, false, true. Uh, edit out the last 45 seconds of this video. Now I am oring together this one and this one. Okay, here we go. So false or false is false. Uh, tr false or true is true. Uh, true or false is, 
uh, true, and true or true is true. All right, that wasn't a that was a, a dark moment for for truth tables there, uh, because they weren't even helping me um, show something obvious. Uh, but okay, we're back. What have I noticed? Aha! I have noticed that these are the same as these. All right, so by an extremely tedious uh, application, eventually uh, correctly, of the uh, definitions uh, of the connectives, I have arrived at the following uh, fact. That uh, this uh, proposition and this proposition are logically equivalent. And, uh, okay, and maybe I, I'm going to like sort of write this down or something, that uh, not uh, P and Q is logically equivalent to uh, not P or not Q. This is what's known as one of the De Morgan's laws. Um, De Morgan is a 19th century British uh, logician, mathematician, uh, and yeah, he is just the first one to have bothered to, to write down this sort of very obvious uh, fact that if it's not true that P and Q, then it means that P is false or Q is false. Uh, okay, so these are logically equivalent, verified via the truth table, and now I will sort of do no more truth tables, and I'll just say some things, and uh, for example, that uh, this is the other uh, propositional logic to Morgan Law, that the negation of P or Q is um, not P and not Q. So uh, this says that negation distributes through a disjunction uh, and, and, and is, is equal to the conjunction of the negations. So if it's not true that P or Q is true, then it means that P is false and Q is false. Okay, and uh, if you don't believe me, well, you should, but if you really, really don't believe me, you can just check this with the truth table. What's the other one we saw? You know, that's not P uh, or uh, Q. Uh, we saw was logically equivalent to P arrow Q, which is why computer scientists, uh, for example, who are like building logic gates and whatever, don't need to really be caring so much about this conditional. Uh, because, uh, and it's probably why I don't think in ninth grade computer science that you even talks about conditionals at all, uh, per se, because you don't need them. Uh, under this very bad but kind of okay um, uh, <laughs> analysis of, uh, of conditionals uh, is just equal to, you know, not P or Q. And uh, so, okay, uh, feel free to, to rewrite this as this anytime, anytime you want. All right, um, what else? Um, what else, what else, what else? Uh, there are a bunch more. Uh, for example, one of the things I told, well, okay, let's just kind of go in order. Are any of these interesting? Well, P exclusive or Q uh, is logically equivalent to, well, what does it mean? It means that they have different truth values. So one way you could put that is that uh, you have, that, that, that's, that's P and not Q, uh, or, um, not P and Q. In other words, uh, P is true and Q is false, or, or P is false and Q is true. Um, another one uh, that I mentioned kind of already is that uh, P, if and only if Q, the biconditional, is just P arrow Q and Q arrow P. Okay, so one may, via truth table, confirm that there are these uh, tons of, of, of um, sentences of propositional logic which are, which are logically equivalent. All right. Uh, what else do we need to say? Uh, what is a tautology? Mm. A tautology is uh, something which is just always uh, true. So, uh, for example, um, uh, let's just make a little tiny truth table over here. Uh, if you have P, then uh, the following uh, sentence, P arrow P, is just always true. Because, look, P is either true or false. But true arrow true is true, but false arrow false is also true. And so uh, we have a name for, for sentences like this. We call them tautologies. They're tautologies uh, because they're true simply by virtue of their form, uh, regardless of any sort of facts whatsoever. In other words, it doesn't matter what P is. It doesn't matter whether P is true or false. Any sentence of the form P arrow P is just automatically uh, true. And then uh, you have these other kinds of things um, called, well, so such, such as uh, P and uh, not P. 
So, okay, if that's P, I can uh, make, I can construct not P, which is going to be uh, false true, and then I can make P and not P, and what's that? Well, true and false is uh, false, and false and true is also false. Okay, so, so this is called, okay, different people call this different things. You can call this a contradiction. Uh, you can call it an unsatisfiable uh, proposition. You can call it whatever you want, but uh, this is never true. Uh, regardless of whether P is true or false, this is false. All right, um, so what's up? Tautologies, contradictions, logical equivalents. I'm supposed to give some examples and stuff. Uh, various tautologies, that seems, that seems good enough. Um, converse, inverse, contrapositive. Yeah, um, is that later or is that now? I think that's now. <laughs> Ba, 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 ba. Good. Okay. Is any of this helpful for doing math? Maybe. Almost. Kind of. A little bit. Um, let me erase some, but not all of this. And erase maybe just maybe just there something. Um, so okay. Uh, you have these. Very, so so so. Given any conditional. Uh, like uh, P arrow uh, Q. If this is the conditional, then there are these uh, sort of other conditionals that we often uh, use to refer to um, to this conditional. And uh, okay, it's I hope you already know all these all these things. But if you don't, um, now is the time to learn. Um, so this is this is my um, th well. Okay, let me just write them out. There's this one. Q arrow uh, P. There's uh, this one, uh, well, I guess if I'm doing this sort of carefully, I should, I should do this. And that's a not P arrow not Q. And then there is a not Q arrow not P. All right, so, so what's going on here? Let's just kind of do this once and for all. What is this? It's true, false, uh, true, uh, true. Facts that we've already discussed. What's Q arrow P? Uh, true arrow true is... Uh, true. False arrow true is also true, but true arrow false is false, and false arrow false is, is false. Uh, let me I'll just do all of them, right? So false, false, true, true, of course. Here we get false, true, false, true. Here we get false arrow false is true. False, uh, if the antecedent is false, it's automatically true. This one is false, but this one is true. And finally, false arrow false, true, true arrow false, False, false arrow true is true, and true arrow true is true. All right, these have various names. If this is a conditional, conditional, then um, uh, with antecedent P and consequent Q, then Q arrow P is a related conditional in which the antecedent and consequent have swapped places. And so if this is my conditional, this is what's called the converse. Okay, I, I swear you learned this in like middle school, but if somehow you've spent your entire uh, high school up till now and you still have never figured out what a converse is, uh, it's incredible, but uh, I hope now you know. <laughs> okay, so, um, and uh, yeah, what's, what's relevant here is that if you compare the, the true table for PRQ and the true table for the converse, they are not logically equivalent. So it's just not true that a particular conditional is the same thing as its converse. When you make that mistake, uh, you call that, uh, we call that a converse error. And so there's all kinds of times in like, you know, geometry when you, when you do this, for example, I don't know, there's something called like the isosceles triangle theorem, for example. What is the isosceles triangle theorem? That's what I used to call it. It says that if you have an isosceles triangle, you know, then the base angles are equal. That's the isosceles triangle theorem. Well, mm, there is something called, you know, the converse, or some people call it base angles theorem, which I find kind of lame. But then there's the converse of the isosceles uh, triangle theorem. And what is the converse of the isosceles triangle theorem? Well, it's just the converse. Uh, it's the one that says um, that uh, if the base angles are equal, then uh, the sides are, are, are equal. So it's often true in sort of some simple geometric concepts that you have a sort of a theorem, 
uh, that you can prove, and then you can also prove the converse. And if that's true, then you can say very bold things like, you know, the, the sides of the triangle are equal if and only if the base angles are equal. Okay, so it's very important that, I think, to do, to do advanced mathematics, it's very important that you can throw around terms like uh, converse and, 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 and you know uh, that people can throw them around and then you know exactly what those people are talking about. Uh, this is perhaps a misleading example because in this case they're both true, but of course there are situations in math uh, where a theorem is true but the converse is false. And uh, various, you know, classification theorems are like this. For example, uh, every uh, square is a rectangle. If it's a square, then it's a rectangle. That's just true. But the converse is false. If it's a rectangle, then it's a square. So it's, uh, there are uh, examples abound in mathematics in which a certain statement is true, but the converse is false. Okay, so we got to kind of keep those straight. Uh, all right, what's this? Not P, Aram, not Q. This is what's known as the inverse. This is like barely comes up and is like just not important and no one ever uh, talks about it, but, but, that's, but that's it. And uh, you can notice that the converse and the inverse are in fact logically equivalent to each other. And finally, here comes something important. I also think you all know this already, but it's possible that some of you don't, so that's why you're watching this video. There's this thing called the contrapositive. Uh, what is the contrapositive of, of, a, of a certain specific conditional? Uh, the, well, if I have a conditional P, R, Q, the contrapositive of that conditional is the conditional not Q, R, not P. Uh, in other words, you negate the antecedent and the consequent, and you swap them. Uh, what is the contrapositive? It's the inverse of the converse, or the converse of the inverse. And uh, worth noting is that um, a conditional and its contrapositive are uh, always uh, equal. So, um, yeah, that's uh, a very sort of important fact to know uh, because it means that uh, Oftentimes, it's maybe simpler to just prove the contrapositive of some statement that you're trying to prove. For example, it already came up in class that we proved some theorem, right? The theorem we proved is that uh, if uh, n squared is even, uh, we found ourselves uh, needing, then n is even. Okay, so here's already a case in which uh, maybe uh, your life has been enriched by, by knowing some formal logic, uh, how did we prove this? Uh, we needed this, by the way, as a lemma for our proof that the square root of 2 is irrational. How did we prove it? Uh, you know, we, we, we did some stuff. Uh, but what you might say, if you want to be like smooth or something, is instead of proving this um, conditional, let me just prove the contrapositive. And the contrapositive is logically equivalent to the conditional, so proving the contrapositive is equivalent to proving the conditional. What is the, what is the contrapositive? Uh, contrapositive. Uh, well, the contrapositive is that if n is odd, then n squared is odd. Ha ha! This is now just kind of like obviously true, right? And in fact, uh, our uh, proof of this, uh, of this lemma that we needed was a little bit kind of convoluted and strange or something like that. Probably the easiest way to do it would be to just recognize that the contrapositive of it is this sentence, because this sentence is just obviously true, right? If you take an odd number, odd times odd is odd, so, n, so if n is odd, n squared is odd. Okay, so it is, uh, it is worth uh, knowing these, these terms and understanding exactly what they are. Uh, okay, um, let's be done with propositional logic. And let's do a little kind of final exam question or something like that. Um, so, yeah, let me erase all this. Here comes, here comes final exam uh, question. I think I put something like, uh, almost exactly like this on the, the test I used to give when I taught uh, logic in my ninth grade geometry class. So here, here is a sentence of English. If P and Q are even, then P plus Q is even. So if uh, P and Q are even, um, then uh, P plus Q is even. Okay, so this is my conditional. Uh, first of all, is this conditional true or false? I guess it's just true, right? Whenever, P, whenever two numbers are both even, then their sum is also even. Okay, so I declare uh, this uh, sentence uh, true. Okay, let us now, uh, here, here's the task, uh, construct the converse of this and tell me whether it's true or false. 
and construct the uh, contrapositive of this and tell me whether it's true or false. All right, well, what's the converse? Uh, I think that one's kind of easy. The converse says if uh, P plus Q is even, then P and Q are even. That is false. That is false because it's possible for the sum of two numbers to be even, uh, and yet those two numbers are not uh, even. Uh, for example, here's our, here's our uh, what's called a, a counterexample. Um, you know, P could be, be 3 and uh, Q could be 5. Now we have that, that 3 plus 5 is, is 8, and yet uh, P and Q are not even. Okay, mm, the contrapositive. What is the contrapositive? Okay, well here we need to be quite kind of careful, right? But what is the contrapositive? It's the uh, conditional uh, that you get from, from negating both of these and flipping the order. So, okay, so, so we begin. Uh, if uh, P plus Q is odd, odd is kind of the opposite of even, right? Then, well, now I need to be careful. I need to negate this antecedent. But this antecedent says P and Q are even. It's more fun if we do this live because some people mess it up. Um, if you're being very uh, not careful, you might think that the negation of P and Q are even is the sentence P and Q are odd. But that would be wrong. Because P and Q are even is really just a kind of a more uh, efficient, compact way of saying P is even and Q is even. And if I want to negate uh, if I want to, to, to negate um, P is even and uh, Q is even, then it's not that P and Q are odd, it's that P and Q are not both even. Or, in fact, that P is odd or Q is odd. So uh, the, the, the correct way to sort of translate uh, this, to the, cor the correct way to write the contrapositive of this um, of this conditional is, if P plus Q is odd, then you can either say uh, P and Q are not both uh, even, or uh, perhaps better, uh, P is odd or uh, Q is odd. In other words, what I'm doing is I'm applying the De Morgan's laws uh, to say that the negation of this, uh, of this uh, conjunction is the disjunction of the negations. And now we see that, uh, that this sentence is true, right? Because uh, if um, P plus Q is odd, then the only way for that to be true is if one of them is odd. And so it's true that P is odd or Q is odd. In fact, exactly one of them is. Okay, um, so, so I guess what I skipped is the part where you, where you sort of mess this up, right? The, the screw-up, which would have been wrong, would have been to negate, uh, negate uh, this antecedent as um, uh, P and uh, Q is odd, or are odd. But uh, that's, uh, that would be a mistranslation, and... Um, and you can see that that is true, that that is a mistranslation by uh, considering uh, an example. Uh, here's, here's kind of an example um, where, you know, P is uh, 2 um, and Q is 3, uh, say. So now P plus Q is odd, so that antecedent is true, but now it's just false that P and Q are odd, because only one of them is odd. So that would maybe lead you to believe that this, that this contrapositive was false. But of course we know that the, the contrapositive uh, is logically equivalent to the original conditional. The original conditional is definitely true, so this contrapositive has to be true also. So this is just a bad translation, uh, and um, good. Uh, so the, the, what's written there in purple is correct. Okay. That was propositional logic. Did you learn something? I bet you learned something. I'm going to pause this video and be right back with more things. Okay, I slightly lied that we were done with propositional logic because I forgot one big important thing, which is that the, what this was all building up to was an analysis of logical argumentation. 
And, uh, okay, we can spend two minutes on this or something. Um, there's this thing called an argument. What is, a, uh, what is an argument? Uh, an argument uh, goes like this. It has some premises, and then it has uh, a conclusion. Okay, so these uh, guys are uh, called uh, premises. So this is, this is premise one, and this is premise two, and this is my uh, conclusion. And uh, what we do uh, in uh, mathematical proofs is we, you know, construct arguments, and we hope that those arguments are valid. What does it mean for an argument to be valid? Well, it means that the conclusion follows from um, the premises. Uh, and so we begin our mathematical argument with some, with some sort of facts, and then we hope that we've uh, reasoned uh, correctly, and uh, then we can trust our conclusion. Uh, what is the... so, okay, what, what does it mean for an argument to be valid? An argument is valid if uh, the truth of the conclusion is guaranteed by the truth of the premises. In other words, an argument is valid if, whenever the premises are true, the conclusion is true. And so, this is a uh, certain uh, argument, or this is a, a type of argument, um, and it's called modus ponens. And not going into that any more deeply, but one may uh, prove that modus ponens uh, is valid uh, by um, constructing a truth table. Man, I thought we were done with truth tables. Uh, and looking at uh, P arrow Q, and what is it? It's true, false, true, true. And so, now, uh, what do I mean when I say this argument is valid? I mean this argument is valid if whenever the premises are true, the conclusion is true. Okay, well, when are the premises true? Uh, P arrow Q is true three times, but uh, P is true only two times. And so the only time that P, uh, that both premises are true, uh, because this, this is premise uh, 1, and this is premise 2, and so uh, the only time that premise 1 and premise 2 are both true at the same time is uh, this first row of the truth table. And in this uh, first row uh, of the truth table, we see in, in this one, um, well, uh, we see that the conclusion is true. In other words, that you may always follow this argument, and you will not go awry, because a concluding Q from P, R, Q, and P is guaranteed to be safe. Uh, because Q will always be true when this is true and this is true. Great. Uh, okay, so, um, so, so, so we say that this argument is valid. An example of an invalid argument, uh, well, an example of an invalid argument would be uh, this making some kind of converse error. So if you concluded uh, from P, R, Q, if you tried to conclude Q, R, O, P, and you made this thing I was just calling, uh, calling the converse error, well, that would be bad, because don't feel like doing a whole other truth... Well, man, I guess I should. Uh, so, um, yeah, wasting my time, wasting your time. So true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. And this is uh, true, uh, false, uh, true, true. And this is... Uh, fa um, man, what am I doing? True, uh, true, uh, false, true. Okay, and so, uh, if you try to conclude from P, R, Q, Q, R, O, P, uh-oh, you are in some trouble, because now, mm, there are a lot of times when, uh, this, now we have only one premise, uh, this one, and there are a lot of times when, uh, this premise is true. Specifically here, this premise is true, and uh, here this premise is true, and this one also. And in one of these cases, specifically uh, this one, uh, this is um, this is false. And so uh, I cannot follow in general arguments like this because I cannot trust uh, this conclusion. Um, uh, based on this premise. Uh, after all, another way of putting it is, the premise could be uh, true, which it is right here, and yet the conclusion false. Specifically, under the condi under this situation in which um, P is false and Q is true, this will be true, but this will be false. And so this is an invalid argument. And so uh, one reason to study propositional logic is it gives you a uh, way of analyzing uh, valid argumentation. 
you can point at certain argument structures and you can say, this is a valid argument, and uh, great, and you can sort of justify that in some kind of mathematical way. Mm. All right. Uh, the thing is that this is not a logic class, so we're not going to do all the things that we do in logic, uh, which is now constructing an entire kind of like proof system and structure, uh, which guarantees at every step that you are following a logical arguments only. You can do that, uh, and it's quite kind of fun and interesting, but it's not absolutely necessary uh, to do mathematics, uh, and so we're not going to do it in this class. But uh, I'll leave it at that, and... Yeah. So, we should be sure for the rest of this course that when we reason, uh, we reason correctly. And uh, I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do that, but if there is some dispute as to uh, one person's uh, logic, hopefully now at least we have the vocabulary and the grounding such that we can analyze someone's logical argument and uh, point to the, the, the part of it which is invalid. And um, that's, that would be, that's, that's nice. Okay. More, 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 it's going to end up just being 90 minutes, uh, which makes me sad. Uh, that was propositional logic. Well, great. Uh, propositional logic is good for some things, but it's not good enough for everything. We need uh, more. We need uh, predicate logic. What is predicate logic? Right, I'm just not even going to try to give a good uh, explanation of predicate logic. Um, I can do that, but it just takes too long, and we have a logic class for that. So, uh, what is predicate logic? It is a different kind of logic. It is more expressive. It's a logic in which uh, we now look inside the proposition and uh, instead of just treating uh, propositions uh, as atomic propositions, that's literally what we call them, uh, which cannot be analyzed internally, in predicate logic we can analyze our propositions internally. We can sort of look inside the proposition and in, in, in in predicate logic, what we do is we decompose uh, atomic sentences into the sort of predicate and subject. And we're asserting that certain predicates hold up certain subjects. Okay. Um, yeah. What does Gossett have to say? Not much good stuff, to be perfectly honest. Um, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so, so, so we can, we can, so, so there are these kind of sentences, right? So let's just give an example of predicate logic. Well, there exists an x, this is kind of Gossett's example, there exists an x uh, such that uh, x squared plus 1 equals 0. Okay, well, um, you know we're in the world of predicate logic when suddenly these quantifiers appear. Now, I think every person in this, in this, in this class is familiar with these quantifiers, so I won't explain things, you know, too well. But uh, this means that there exists an x such that this is true. Alright, well, is this true or false? Uh, answer, it depends. Um, this sentence is true uh, if... Uh, our uh, sort of world is the world of the complex numbers, because then x would be i, also negative i. But it's false uh, if um, our world is the world of real numbers, because there's no real number which one squared is, is negative one. All right, so um, this kind of thing is what's called a domain of discourse. A domain of discourse is a um, sort of stipulated in advance uh, universe uh, of objects that we are agreeing are under discussion. And the quantifiers range over those objects. Okay, uh, and so uh, to, to, to keep going with this uh, kind of example, suppose I said something like uh, for all x, uh, x squared is um, uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, well, uh, I have to be careful the way I put this, but um, <laughs> oh, that's that's uh, again uh, kind of uh, kind of stupid. Well, uh, okay, um, let me let me not uh, let me let me. Okay, no, here, new example for all x um, uh, for all x uh, if if. Uh, if x is greater than 0, then x is greater than or equal to 1. Right, this is the stupidest example ever, but sure. 
uh, now I am just bringing up the, the, the second kind of quantifier, the universal quantifier, and this is to be interpreted as uh, referring to sort of all possible x values. So is this true? Is it true that for any number, if it's bigger than zero, then it's uh, greater than or equal to one? Well, this is true uh, if our world is like the world of integers, but it's like kind of false if um, it's the world of like say rational numbers. Because in rational numbers, you can have uh, a number like one half, which is greater than, <coughs> greater than zero, but, but not greater than or equal to one. All right, I think I've proven my point. That's called the domain of discourse. All right, um, yeah. You can think of sentences like, uh, there exists some x with property p. This kind of like means that something has property p. So this is like saying that uh, a one has property p, or a two has property p, or etc. for the possibly infinite uh, number of um, elements in my domain. And so in some ways, quantifiers are not really needed uh, if you are only looking at sort of finite objects. But if we want to look at infinite uh, sets of objects, uh, for example, you know, the set of natural numbers, which is still sort of within the, the realm of discrete mathematics, then uh, we can no longer just list out every single possible um, natural number. Uh, and so if I want to say, um, you know, uh, like, like, oh, oh my god. Uh, you know, if you want to say uh, something silly like there's a, uh, well, I'm not even going to give an example, but uh, if I want to say something like, you know, there, there's, uh, there exists a, um, no, I'm not going to give an example, because examples are gone. But this, this is kind of what this means. And then the universal quantifier for all x, uh, p of x, this just kind of means, you know, for every object this is true. So p of a1, and p of a2, and blah, 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 and p of a n. So once again, you, you should sort of think of uh, the universal quantifier as like the infinite version of like a conjunction. You're um, performing the conjunction over sort of all possible elements in the domain. All right. Um, let's just like, just, just like be done with this as soon as possible. Um, mm, let's see, where are we now? We are on page 63. Ah. Here, Gossett introduces a concept that's somewhat subtle, and I don't even teach this uh, super well uh, in my logic class. Uh, that is a uh, concept of a bound variable and a free variable. You know what, I just decided I don't want to do that. Uh, let's see, what else? The Morgan's Law Yeah, let's just do that. Let's just do... Let's just do a quick thing and then move on. Gossip is a long explanation, which I kind of don't recommend. Are we really done? Yeah, great. Uh, a <laughs> um, uh, long explanation, which I don't recommend uh, reading, uh, per se. But uh, let's just discover some things, kind of right now, about... Uh, about... Um, predicate logic. Well, here's one. Um, suppose it's not true that um, it's not true that for all x uh, p of x. Well, what does that mean? Well, for all x p of x means that everything has property p. But if it's not true that everything has property p, then it seems that something must not have property p. So if p is some predicate like, I don't know, prime, then if it's not true that everything is prime, then that means that there exists something which is not prime. And I think that works the other way as well. If there exists something which is not prime, then it means that it's not true that everything is prime. This is not a proof, and notice that I'm not making a truth table to justify this. I am simply invoking uh, some basic level of common sense that you have. And uh, it actually requires quite a lot of work to, um, you know, to, to, to prove uh, something like this. So uh, that's, that's not what we're going to do right now. But uh, this is a De Morgan Law. This is the uh, De Morgan Law. This is um, the predicate logic version uh, of um, the De Morgan's Laws that we saw for propositional logic. And if you are encouraged to think 
of the universal quantifier as uh, a long string of possibly infinite conjunctions, then this makes complete sense, right? Because if it's not true that uh, a1 is prime and p2 and a2 is prime and blah, 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 and am is prime, then uh, when you distribute the negation through this infinite uh, conjunction, what do you do? You um, negate all of the, the, the propositions and you flip the and to an or. And so what you get then is that it's not true that a1 is prime or it's not true that a2 is prime or, and that's exactly what this is saying. Okay, I should probably have written, have written that down, but I don't feel like it. Uh, there's also the other one. Mm, the other one is that it's not true. Uh, suppose it's not true that there exists uh, something which is prime. Well, if, it's, if, if there's not a prime number, then it must be mean that everything is not a prime number. Okay, and so, all right, these are like very, very helpful. Um, one reason, I think the only good reason uh, for this class to be studying uh, predicate logic, and I say studying because you're either not watching this video at all or watching it in two times speed and I only spent about four minutes on it, um, is because it does, there are often times very complicated mathematical arguments, which, if you're very smart, um, you don't need logic, uh, or at least you don't need formal logic to analyze, because you just do it, man, and you're just right. But oftentimes, I personally get lost, and there's just too many things happening, and I just can't keep it all in my head at once. I get kind of confused. And uh, because it's all sort of too hard for me, I need to, like, write some of it down, man. And oftentimes, if there's some very kind of complicated things going on, lots of stuff, uh, sometimes it's helpful to actually to, to write down what's going on in, in predicate logic. And uh, then uh, it clarifies, you know, maybe, maybe some of your thinking in the matter. And in particular, these De Morgan's laws for the quantifiers are very useful uh, in this kind of context. All right, and so I'm going to end this video uh, with one big example. Um, and let's, let's do it. Um, I don't have this written down or anything, but I think I know what I'm talking about. Uh, let's see. All right, just, you know, this week and last week in Analysis 1A, I am teaching them about limits, and I am teaching them about the epsilon delta definition of a limit, everyone's favorite uh, subject in all of high school math. Mm, what's the epsilon delta definition of a limit? It says that uh, the limit as x approaches a of f of x is l, uh, if and only if, so maybe I want to even throw in one of those, and now notice just like suddenly all these quantifiers appear, right? Uh, and, uh, well, uh, it's true if and only if for all epsilon greater than zero, we may have uh, said uh, once upon a time. But, once you have been trained in the world of logic, then uh, we can actually write this out uh, more clearly. Because when I say for all epsilon greater than, uh, greater than zero, what I really mean is for all epsilon, if epsilon is greater than zero, then there exists a delta, so there exists a delta which is supposed to also be greater than zero, so there exists a delta which is greater than zero, and uh, what is uh, supposedly uh, true uh, about uh, that delta, that uh, for all x, if um, the distance between x and a is less than delta, then the distance between f of x and l is less than epsilon. And now, close, close, close. Okay, um, that is hopefully pretty clear. In, uh, back in analysis 1a, we probably wrote this out more casually as just, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that for all x, if I'm pretty close to, um, to a, specifically within delta, then my outputs are pretty close to epsilon. Okay, and so, uh, all right, I'll just assume that you have perfect recall of this kind of thing. This is a quite uh, complicated and complex um, statement uh, with multiple quantifiers, and it's pretty hard, actually. Um, so logic can, can help us, maybe. Um, specifically, uh, let's just take it even one step further. Let's even throw in an extra quantifier. 
Let's um, define what it means for a function to be continuous. So f is um, continuous at x equals a if and only if. Well, what does it mean to be continuous? It means that, um, that the limit is the function. So, uh, is the value of the function. So, f is continuous at x equals a if and only if uh, for all epsilon greater than zero, no, sorry, for all epsilon, if epsilon is greater than zero, then there exists a delta and uh, delta is greater than zero, and uh, for all x, uh, if uh, the distance between x and a is less than delta, uh, then um, the distance between f of x and l, no, but now l is f of a, um, is less than epsilon, and cha, 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 cha. Okay, and here the picture is like something like this, uh, you will recall, um, so that's A, and yeah, so this is discrete math class, so it's sort of just outrageous or something like that, that we would be uh, talking about um, the epsilon delta definition of a limit. The reason only to, to be talking about this is because it is, up until now, uh, probably the most complicated uh, definition you have ever encountered that you had to kind of master and, and use uh, fluently and involves a lot of quantifiers and not just a whole bunch of them but in fact a s quantifier swaps so it's like for every epsilon there exists a delta so now this delta depends on that epsilon and in fact that's one of the things that you had to master uh, was that the, the, the delta response is, is going to be in terms of the epsilon challenge and then, subsequent to that epsilon challenge, for all x, here comes another universal quantifier, uh, and uh, what are the x's? Well, uh, given now the epsilon and the delta, uh, we're talking about all the x's in some sort of delta interval. So, so x depends on delta, and um, that, uh, that, that, there, that there is this, uh, this, this relationship between, between the limit and, and the values of the function. So, okay, so this is kind of like a callback to something you sort of already know. Uh, all right, let me just, I really got to finish this off, man. So this is uh, plus epsilon, and this is f of a uh, minus epsilon. And, you know, you could even, what did I, what, what's my plan? F is like, yeah, okay, good. So, all right, so now comes uh, the challenge. And the challenge is, um, I already just like forgot what it was. I was trying to do, um, give me one second, I guess all I want to do is explore, okay, I want to understand, I guess, what it means um, if f is not continuous. So suppose you tell me that f is not continuous at x equals a. Well, if f is not continuous at x equals a, then what am I to do? Well, then it means I just throw a gigantic uh, negation in there in front of this thing. And if I do that, what happens? Okay, and now, here is the, this is, this is where I'm supposedly convincing you that this was all, all the time we spent on this was worth it. Because now, uh, I probably, well, I could probably do this because I, I think I basically get it. But here, uh, by knowing quantifiers and knowing the de Morgan's laws for quantifiers, it enables you to kind of almost automate uh, and let the symbols kind of think for themselves and do a lot of the work. So what I'm now going to do uh, is I'm going to throw in a negation in front of this. So, okay, not uh, for all epsilon. And now let me do a bunch of things. Let me replace all these arrows with what I know to be a logically uh, equivalent uh, proposition. So what does it mean to say if epsilon is greater than zero then there exists a delta? Well we know that, um, let me write this over here, uh, we know that p arrow q is logically equivalent to not p or q. So let me take this opportunity, because I don't want to write a million things, to write this as epsilon is less than or equal to zero. In other words I negate the antecedent and I replace this arrow with or 
there exists a delta uh, such that uh, delta is greater than zero and um, for all x, uh, oh, and now, once again, I will replace this arrow. Uh, because uh, P arrow Q is dimming is not P or Q, so therefore either this is false. Whew. So what does that mean? Um, well, this is also a compound inequality. Yikes! So um, okay, so jeez. Uh, okay, so the negation of this would be the negation of uh, x. Uh, absolute value of x is greater than zero and absolute value x minus a is less than delta, cha, um, or um, f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon. All right, it's possible that I just lost everybody and thus making this whole thing uh, worthless. Let me try to, to explain myself one more time. Uh, what did I do? This is a compound inequality. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated than it needs to be, but it says that the distance between x and a is less than delta, but also, actually, you know what? I don't think I need to even ex I don't even think I need to do that now because uh, I think because I'm defining continuity, I can just take that off. Let me just take that off. And so uh, this becomes just uh, the negation of um, uh, absolute value x minus a is less than, than delta. So then that means that the distance between x and a is greater than or equal to delta. Or this. Okay. So, um, so, uh, so, so, what, what have I done? I took this arrow and I rewrote it as not. Notice I negated this to to change it to greater than or equal to. Or consequent. I negate. I replaced this arrow with uh, not epsilon greater than or equal to zero, greater than zero, which is epsilon less than or equal to zero. Or and, blah, 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 blah. and then, of course, the, the, the biggest thing I did is I put a negation in front of this whole thing. All right, so if you're following, what just happened? I performed various uh, manipulations on my statement that f is continuous at x equals a. And, uh, and now I put a negation in front. So what is that going to mean? The meaning of this sentence right now is that f is not continuous at x equals a. Well, let's apply the uh, De Morgan's laws, uh, and let me just do this all in just like one step. So here we go. Let's see if we can do it. <gasps> Distribute this negation through this universal quantifier. How do you do that? Well, you flip the quantifier. That's the um, De Morgan laws for the quantifiers. So this means that there exists an epsilon. Now the negation is sitting right here. Well, I need to now distribute this negation through this gigantic uh, mo outermost bracket, which is an OR statement. And so, uh, what I get is that there exists a, an epsilon. Now I have to negate epsilon is less than or equal to zero. So that flips back to being epsilon is greater than zero. And I'm applying now the De Morgan law for the... Um, for the, 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 the propositional De Morgan law. So this negation kind of just, it flipped that quantifier, it popped in, it flipped the, the, the truth value of this sentence, it flipped that or to an and, now the negation is like sitting right here. Well, now it's gonna flip this. So it's beginning to become a not for all delta. Now the negation is sitting right here. Now what is the negation going to do? It's gonna go inside this inner bracket and this is an AND statement. So what do we get? D is uh, greater than zero, so this becomes delta is less than or equal to zero, or, well, okay, or, let's be bold, let's just say that that, okay, well, uh, all right, one more time. So delta is greater than, less than or equal to zero, or, 
Now there's another, now, the, now I need to negate this universal statement, so that becomes a, uh, there exists an x such that, now I have a negation that needs to go into this disjunction, and it flips this one and this one, and what we end up back again with is that absolute value x minus a is greater than delta, uh, less, less than delta, uh, and yet, uh, absolute value f of x minus f of a is greater than or equal to epsilon. Close, close, close. All right, what just happened? Instead of showing the nine steps that were required for everyone to understand it, I just did it all in one step, talking it out as I go. But basically, I just applied the De Morgan's laws again and again and again and again, and distributed this negation all the way through. Kind of like mindlessly, but actually mindless is kind of awesome in this case, because what do we have? We have, there exists an epsilon, such that epsilon is greater than zero, and it's not true that for all delta, and here I'm going to do one more thing, which is I'm going to convert this back to an arrow, because this is like not P or Q, right? So this is really like saying, if uh, delta is greater than zero, uh, then... Wait, what the hell happened? Uh, that shouldn't be not. A not should be gone. There's not, oh my god. There exists, flip, flip, and then the not, but then I distributed the not through. Okay, okay, this is right. That was just a, kind of like a typo. Uh, arrow, um, there exists an x such that x minus a is less than delta, and uh, f of x minus f of a is greater than or equal to epsilon. Okay, here comes the payoff. The payoff is, via mindless manipulation, and this is why the mindless manipulation is powerful, I have written a statement which, hopefully, if I didn't mess up, um, means that f is not continuous at x equals a. Let's uh, try to analyze this sentence. Well, here's what it says. It says, yo. So let's just think of what it means uh, for the function to to not be continuous at a. Well, here's a, here's f of a, or something like that. And here's what it says. Or maybe I want to, maybe I want to do this. Um, I mean, the thing is, there's so many different ways for a function to be uh, discontinuous that no one picture is going to capture them all. But uh, here, here's a picture. This picture certainly is, is this function is discontinuous at a. Well, here's what it says. There is an epsilon. So some challenge out there exists such that epsilon is greater than, greater than zero. So it's a legit epsilon. And for all possible delta, so in other words, some challenge is made, and now some delta response comes. And what is uh, the delta response? Uh, the, the delta response is how close to A I need to get in order for it all to work out. But what this is now saying is that for all possible delta, if delta is positive, so in other words, even when delta is positive, there is an x, so there's some x that the distance between x and a is less than delta. In other words, there's some x value that is in here, say, uh, such that the distance between x and a is less than delta, and yet the distance between f of x and f of a is greater than or equal to epsilon. So it's almost like magic, right? This point is x comma f of x. Uh, the the um, De Morgan's laws for the quantifiers kind of uh, made some sense of uh, the negation of what it means for f to be continuous at x equals a. And it's actually a completely coherent uh, kind of final line that we have here. Um, there's some epsilon, in other words, some challenge uh, is um, severe enough that For any delta whatsoever, 
In other words, no matter how close to A you try, um, still it will be the case that there is some x which, no matter how hard you tried to pick a good delta, this x is within delta of A, and yet um, the gap between f of x and f of A is greater than the challenge. So um, this is just a completely uh, coherent uh, interpretation of what it means for, um, for f to be discontinuous at A. All right, got a little tired there for the last half an hour. Uh, that was pretty good. Uh, watch this or not, and I will see you back. There's going to be a bunch of little homework problems on, uh, on logic from chapter 2. Goodbye.